Hello and welcome along to episode 20 of the Perth Paisley podcast, a podcast dedicated to Heart and Midlothian Football Club. Despite no match of the weekend there, it's now eight straight wins for the Jambos and I'm one of your hosts, Adam Kennedy, and joining me to discuss all Maroon matters, as always, is Mr. Daniel McIver. What's happening, Daniel? I'm not bad because, guess what, Adam? Scotland have qualified for an international tournament. It certainly is. It's a minor miracle. Um... But obviously, delighted to say that yet again, for the third week in succession, we've happened to secure a special guest. Um, a first for Perth Paisley, it's our first non-Hearts supporting guest. Um, this young man is one of the best people I've ever met in my puff. He's a journalist for Inter Milan based site SempreInter.com, a Dunfermline and Athletic diehard and pure championship podcast host, along with being one of Fife College's most handsome alumni, it's Mr. Cammy Anderson. Cameron, how are you? I mean, uh, I don't think I've ever been introduced better than that before, and I think someone will struggle to introduce me better, but ap- absolutely grand, boys. Delighted to be on. Excellent. Glad You've never hear. given me an intro that good. No, because I mean, it's just... It's just basic, isn't it? It's just that it's just us two mugs every week. Cammy's, wow. you know... Cammy's giving us some expert insight. Um, wow. But for those wondering, Cammy's obviously here to give us an outsider's insight into the BBC documentary, This Is Our Story, Inside Hearts, and give us a taste of what we can expect when we take on his beloved pars at East End Park this Friday night. However, before we get into that, Daniel, I think we should briefly discuss the game against East Fife, which saw Hearts claim four wins from as many Betfred Cup group stage games and set up a tie away against Allo Athletic in the round of 16, who Cammy is actually voluntarily commentating for at the minute. Um, I'm going to try and get rid of all my negative energy here because I'm not going to lie. When I saw we had gone 2-0 up inside a matter of minutes with both all the goals coming in the first 80 seconds, I was expecting an absolute whitewash. The fact that we've only gone on to win 3-2, I'm sort of left a, a little underwhelmed. Are you not? No, because again, I will continue to be the positivity in this podcast somehow despite my natural ways of being the most depressed person in the world however no i think it's fine like listen see if that was first team and we scored two goals inside 90 seconds and then struggled to a 3-2 then yeah i'd be worried if it was at home i'd be worried if it was even away on a normal football pitch i'd be a bit worried however we had eight changes from the Inverness game Three of them were, of course, forced as Craig Gordon, Liam Boyce and Michael Smith were away. However, we'd basically won the group. Nielsen has said, in not as many words, but with his body language and way of talking about it, that he doesn't really give a shit about this competition. And he was always going to play the youth. So we had individuals like Scott McGill and people like Jamie Brandon, who is on the fringes but not really in the mainstay coming in. Christoph Berra played his first game in more than half a year, coming back from not only lockdown but injury. We didn't have some of the crucial people like Herring and Walker. And the pitch itself is its a complete game changer. A plastic pitch changes the game entirely. Teams who aren't used to it can't play well in it. And we still got the job done. Yeah, obviously, inside 90 seconds, you're tuning up and you're loving life. But I think everybody would have expected a wee bit of a harder game and then that ended up being the case to be honest they came back into it Um, Stuart actually made a couple of really good saves especially in that first half but I would say especially in the second they didn't look like much and we still got the job done with the reserves 8 wins from 8 I'm buzzing Do you not get sort of frustrated with the backup brigade though because I'm I'm not being funny, but these players should have all the motivation that they need in order to turn out a decent performance. We've got a Scottish Cup final next month. Surely you'd be playing for a place in that eleven, no? I do agree. I I agree, but I just think some of the individuals are not good enough. Jamie Brandon is not good enough to be at this club. Like it's been, I tweeted out during the game. If we at any point this season for a sustained period of time need to play. A.D. White left back and Jamie Brandon right back, that's when we could be in trouble. Um, Because A.D. White is fantastic. He's a completely new individual going forward, but defensively he just doesn't look at it. Um, But Jamie Brandon is just infuriating. He was done too easily. However, on that point, 
I think individuals like Scott McGill did really well. I think he came in and didn't really look out of place, especially on a minging night against big players who he probably hadn't come up against before. I thought he did really well. So that does create that discussion of, well, listen, I'm here. I'm not just an option. I can fit into this team. I, I thought the entire midfield were, were pretty decent, to be fair. I think if I were to take the positives, I'd say that we've won at a ground that we've struggled at recently. We've won all four games in the tournament that we've struggled in the past few seasons of, ever since the group format was arguably introduced again. Um, and we've obviously been seeded and handed a, a fairly decent draw for the next round. I think midfield-wise... Ollie Lee's brace is great from a personal perspective, but his second goal is the perfect example of why zonal marking for me is a load of absolute nonsense. Um, and Andy Irving's goal was yet another goal of the season contender. I think other than that, I don't know. There, there's not a great deal I can be, be positive about, to be honest. I thought the goals that we conceded were horrific. A rebound where we don't track the runner and a long ball over the top, which sees their striker bear down on goal. Um, you obviously touched on Christoph Berra, who played his first game for, what, about 10, 11 months? Because yeah. obviously he had, his, he had his loan spell at Dundee as well. Now I can see why he made that loan spell move. Um, I, ju I just felt as though East Fife could have grabbed themselves a couple more in that first half particularly. Um, and against a better side, we probably would have conceded. Um, I think... I just thought it was pretty dire, but maybe I'm just moaning for the sake of moaning. Like you say, we're through. And Robbie sort of downplayed it in his post-match presser, didn't he? Because he was talking about qualification for the next round, winning the group, hoping to try and top it and to get seeded. And he mentioned the rotation, like you say. So I guess in that sense, it's job done. That is the thing. Like, it's not like he just went after it. Oh, that was exactly what I wanted. He said it wasn't good enough, but especially in the last 18 months, we've been complaining about all these things and going, and we didn't even win. But the fact that we can complain about all this and we still won, for me, that's the most important thing. I'm not going to get too annoyed about the reserves playing East Fife and still winning. No, no, I guess not. And do you know what's mental? I've, I've only just thought of this now. But if we get a result at East End on Friday against Cammy's beloved Pars... We'll have already equaled our league wins from the entirety of last season. Oh, How depressing is that? I, I kind of forgot about that stat, to be honest. And half of them came against Hebs, I know that season. Um, it, I mean, it is just a testament. That's what I mean. Like, yes, we can discuss the fragility of our defence, for example, against these five. We can discuss the performance. However,. I said at the start of the season, if we win every single game 1-0 and it's a poor performance, I don't really care. I just want to get out of this league, out of this situation. And so far we're doing that and we haven't even had to win games just 1-0. We've won games 6-2, we've won games 3-2, we've won games 3-1 and stuff like that. So when you compare it to the past, especially as I said 18 months, it's night and day. Yeah, it's understandable. Um, but of course, as some listeners are aware, we record the podcast on Monday nights, and recent Monday nights, I've seen us showcase that entire last eighteen months or so. No, last season even. Yeah. Um, but it feels like longer. Um, so obviously, last week's with Jordan Allen was before the first episode of the brand new BBC documentary titled "This Is Our Story Inside Hearts." I want to take it back to the beginning of that first episode. Um, before it shows anything from the Rangers game, which obviously proved Craig Levine's last as Hearts manager at Tynecastle, Anne Budge herself said that football players come out here to win games. Craig Levine then goes on to blame the injuries for the most part, but admitted that he couldn't put his finger on why Hearts were underperforming. Why, from an outsider's perspective, Cammy, do you think that Hearts struggled last season? Craig Levine being manager would probably be the, the simplest answer. Um, I, I mean, I can't help but feel sorry for Levine, even from kind of the outside looking in. The way he spoke, fair, fair play to him for admitting like he never done done very well in that spell. He you could clearly see he was really wanting to do his best for the club. It's clearly a club that he holds close to his heart, and for a multitude of reasons, things just didn't really pan out. Obviously, 
few signings maybe didn't pan out how he expected them to tactically. Well, yeah, it wasn't fantastic. And then injuries, as he says. And I mean, I think the writing was kind of on the wall for him for a very long time. Um, the fact he lasted as long as he did was very surprising. But, I mean, I think a lot of that has to do with Budge wanting to be loyal to... I mean, I don't know if you would agree with this, given how things ended, but with a Hearts legend, obviously spent ages there as a player and then time as a manager. And, yeah, I, I do kind of feel sorry for him, but at the same time, I don't, because there's no way that you can defend how bad you were. Um, a club such as Hearts, and I'm not just saying this because I'm on the pod, Adam, obviously... I told you this when we were at college together and when we've been together. Hearts are a premiership club. They should be challenging at the top end of the premiership, kind of trying to be that third force. And ultimately, they went last season. They're now in the championship this season. And, I mean, it's, it's a kind of sad state of affairs, I think, would be fair to say. No, definitely. And I I was one of the ones, obviously, calling for change. I'd, I'd spoken to you about my frustrations, whatever, but... I'd, I also really felt for Craig Levine during the documentary too, I've got to be honest. Um, but there was no choice, was there really, Daniel, at that stage to make the switch? No, not at all. I think every Hearts fan wanted him to leave at the end of the Scottish Cup final against Celtic where it was kind of like, yeah, we got beat, but that was a performance to be proud of. Um, everybody expected us to get absolutely battered and we almost won it. We were the better team for 70 minutes. Um so I think a lot of Hearts fans went, yeah, go out then. I know the second half of the season hasn't been great. That's an understatement and a half. However, go out kind of on top almost in a cup final, but he didn't. He stayed and inexplicably got 11 games before he was sacked. Um, however, I'll, we'll go three for three. I just love him. Nothing is ever going to affect my love for Craig Levine. Like, I felt really bad for him, even though I do think it was the right decision. I felt bad for Budge for having to do it. But just, there is no one who can deny that Craig Levine doesn't love this club. I understand how people go, well, if he really loved it, he would have left early. But as a football manager, you have to believe that you are going to be able to get any club out of any slump at any period of time. So... Whilst, obviously, I wish he had left earlier, I, d- I did just feel really bad for him. No, of course. And even going by some of his quotes, I, I think he said something along the lines of, I'll always have a place in my heart for this club. That that got me. And, I mean, it must, it must be tricky. It, it's, it's so easy for somebody not in Levine's shoes to say to step aside. Um, but Levine obviously believed in himself and was adamant that he could turn it around. I have to say, I'm not I'm not too sure how familiar you are with decisions that Hearts have made, Cammy. But Gary Mackay saying it was the worst decision in the history of the club to keep Levine on was a bit strong, was it not? I mean, considering some of the recent history that Hearts have went through, obviously the well-documented financial problems. I mean, I think you could probably argue there was a few worse decisions than keeping Levine on past kind of when he should have gone as. As you say, I mean, I don't think you really wanted him sacked, but you, you did at the same time. You wanted to believe that he could turn things around. Ultimately, that wasn't possible for him. And, I mean, I think as a Hearts fan, well, from kind of your perspective and him being a Hearts man, he'd want to stay as long as possible to try and turn things around. Like, if he le- left sooner, could you imagine the kind of hate he would have got? For, I mean, he was kind of... There wasn't really a winning way for him in this. He left too early. He was going to get fingered for. He's a Hearts man. He's just abandoned the club. He stayed too long. He's he's moaned at for staying too long and being a Hearts man and seeing them into that mess. So, mm-hmm. a, a really unfortunate situation for him and just need to kind of see what management holds for him. But I mean, I think it could be a, a long time before we see him back in management, given what's kind of happened. Of course, I, I think for me, it sort of has shades of. You know, you know, towards the end of Arsene Wenger's tenure at Arsenal, mm-hmm. how he was kind of just hanging on, and he really should have gone a few years before he did. And then Unai Emery's come in, and it's not really worked out. I think, I think there's a lot of similarities between us and Arsenal in that sort of sense. But Daniel, I mean, who sh- who shoulders most of the blame for you? Because it panned to Stephen Naismith, who said the players had hoped that he'd do well. It then went to Andy Irving, who said that he couldn't speak highly enough of him and thanked him for his chance and whatever. And Sean Clare said that Craig Levine would have done anything for Hearts. Is that just 
playing up to the cameras? Or do you feel as though the players regret sort of not doing that wee bit extra to keep them in a job? No, I, th- I think it's maybe a bit of both. But I do think genuinely they really have regrets over how they handled it because at the end of the day, it's their feelings on the pitch that a manager lives and dies by his players. Um, if suddenly... Klopp went on a 25 game losing streak there would suddenly be questions despite what he's done for that club and it's a very I don't even know how to explain it but it's a very like brutal business football management and if your players don't get the results that you're expecting them to then your job is on the line and it's a lot easier to replace one man than a squad um, however of course Levine's tactics were at the basis of it, like it, we weren't going out to win games, we were going out to not lose. And as Cami said, we're a club that should be pushing at the top of the table. Like in our, in our lifetimes, we've split the old firm, we've finished third, we've won multiple Scottish Cups, we've gotten into Europe, we've played in the Champions League. Like we should be doing that. We shouldn't be going out to go, right, can we get a draw against Hamelin? Like that's not what should be happening. But the players. And I think we saw it when Stendhal came in and McPhee in his period. The players needed to have a long, hard look at themselves. And I think that's why so many people were happy with the kind of clear out that we had over this period. That so many players who the fans felt were not at the level did in fact end up leaving the club. Absolutely. I mean, can we get into talking about Austin McPhee? Because, honest to God, just the only time I felt for him was when he and uh, Katrina McCallum were walking around tiny and then he's bombarded by all the journalists because, Mm -hmm. honest to God, he just came across as an absolute wet wipe in that episode. The man who says fuck in every sentence for no real reason. It was Honestly, I was cringing watching him. See, even just kind of... I found it really infuriating watching it back. Like the goals in that Rangers semi final, Jesus wept. The the Hollander one still gives me nightmares to this day. I'm Could still you, convinced you... it was offside. Oh, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I mean, what's it matter when the centre half is <laughs> taking up that position? Um, but just I just thought that he came across so so poorly, which is a shame because. You, you looked at it, and, and I find myself getting a wee bit emotional by all sorts. Like, I miss going to Tiny to watch Hearts, of course, but it seems as though there's a whole host of characters off the park that make Hearts as well. Like, Gary Locke, he is just the epitome of Heart and Midlothian. I absolutely, he came across like a total hero. I well, that's the thing I wanted to ask. I actually wanted to ask you this, Cammy. How did you feel Gary Locke came across? Because the Hearts fans' reception has been that, oh, we love him to pieces. However, I can also appreciate he was very much the David Brent of this situation. And I want to know how a non-Hearts fan viewed him in that episode. I mean, I think he's uh, right in saying he is kind of Hearts through and through. And that, that's certainly how he came across from from me watching it. I mean, just the way he kind of spoke and... I mean, there were some kind of funny jokes along the way, and it did kind of seem like a bit of a gimmick at times, just kind of like, all oh, right, go and record in the hospitality suite and say a wee funny thing. Like, there were some wee bits, but, I mean, I, what a guy. Like, I think all clubs going to have that guy, and obviously someone who has a long history with the club, and I think he came across really well. Probably one of the best kind of performance stars of the show, if you like. Going back to McPhee... I completely agree. I think he was a bit of a weirdo, in all honesty. Um, I mean, when you look more like a, a drummer from a punk rock band than a football manager, um, I just a bit, bit of an oddball to him, but I, Gary Locke, to me, came across fantastically well, and you could really tell just how much he loved the club, kind of on a similar level to, to Craig Levine, and obviously, I, it, was, it was quite nice how he was really heavily focused on, despite him not really playing all that big a part in Hearts these days, it's Obviously, there was the whole thing about the manager changing and stuff, so they couldn't exactly speak to the manager much, but to include someone like that, I think that would have, that certainly made it more relatable for Hearts fans who, who know what Locke kind of means to the club and what the club means to him as well. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> what about his German after staying oh, there? Was, he was so proud of himself. He was like, listen, like this is my moment. I'm going to speak German and everybody's mind are going to be blown that a guy from Bonnerick can speak German. Honestly, I have no idea what Loki does, but whatever he does, he absolutely smashes it. He's just a total hero. Um, even that that Rangers game, though, I couldn't believe the detail that the security cameras could pick up. I mean, we, we talked about terrible decisions. Could the decision perhaps be spending our money elsewhere rather than that little room showing all the cameras and the flag that said, Budge and Levine stole our club. I mean, no, you have to legally have that level of setup. And when you're a club the size of us, you need to. If we didn't have a setup like that, I'd be very, very worried. Um, I think, yeah. I, I mean, even even going back, not necessarily the Rangers game, but even the St Mirren game. I mean, Sean Clare spoke during the Rangers game, or sort of before it, or whatever, saying. That that at home the fans get behind the players. Is that a reason that we struggled, Daniel, due to the, atmo- the lack of atmosphere in the so-called lesser fixtures against your St Mirrens and whoever? I mean, it must do something, because our away record in the last like five years is absolutely dreadful. We are just terrible away from home. However, there is always... There is also sort of that argument of because, for example, everybody this season is speaking about the positives of no fans is Craig Whiten because it allows players with low confidence to get confidence because you don't have fans on your back every single time you make a wee mistake. And let's be honest, you and me know especially as we were there firsthand, even if it was two minutes in, and somebody made a bad pass because of the situation we found ourselves in and how terrible the results were. It was immediate. That was it. You were the, the fans were on the back, rightly or wrongly. But so that I think could have a really negative way. But when the players are saying it's a positive, then it should be a positive. Like if the players are saying to themselves, "This is good when we're at home," then they can't simultaneously go, "Oh, but listen, it's a, it's really hard to play in front of Tank Castle." It's like, well, make up your minds. <laughs> No, that's true. And I think even during that first episode, there was a huge importance placed on the St Mirren game with this, obviously all the remembrance stuff and and the fact that we hadn't won at home that, that season yet. And that was obviously, I think, one of only two home victories in the league. So, I mean, I won't, I won't give Austin McPhee... I'll give him next to no credit regarding his cameo in the documentary, but I thought that his, his team talk pre-St Mirren was good. See, I didn't. I thought it was really staged. I just felt it wasn't it genuine. I just thought he was like, he knows there's a microphone in there, so therefore he's got to say stuff. Cammy, thoughts? Uh, I mean, I, I'm going to agree with Daniel here and say that that was massively staged. I mean, I think with a lot of these documentaries, managers are watching what they're saying and there probably will be a, right, you can come and you can record this, I'll say something good. And then they say something proper once the camera's moved out the way and stuff, because mm-hmm. a lot of these things in these documentaries do need to stay kind of secret, if you like. Obviously, they weren't exactly in and every meeting that Budge had with managers or whatever, and right, rightly so. And I mean, I think that was the same with team talks as well. It's not fair for for managers' team talks to be kind of put out there. Obviously, they're probably going to be, be saying kind of similar stuff, and the language is probably going to be a lot more different than kind of the stuff that was on the telly. But yeah, I, I felt very staged to me. On that point, actually, I've seen a lot of people be like, it's really annoying that we can't see more about the training. It's like, we didn't give permission for that because similar ilk to uh, what Cammy just said about the team talks. I know there's documentaries like uh, the All or Nothing ones with Spurs and Man City and kind of the Sunday Until I Die, you saw a lot more in depth with the players and you saw kind of the day-to-day stuff and what they were doing in really detailed training. We can't do that because we we just clearly went nah because we don't want that getting out. Well, I mean, let's go into the players because I thought Connor Washington seemed a bit of a joker when he was on the the physio bed. Um, I but even such a weird bit. I thought yeah. they didn't do anything with that. <laughs> no, I don't. He and Craig Halkett just discussing their injuries. I thought it was kind of needless, but. I mean, watching Bigucci on the right wing again was some laugh. Uh, but, 
how how infuriating was it when um, Austin McPhee went when he was claiming that Oli Bazanich was one of the best players at the club on second balls and his long range shooting. In I fairness to him, in fairness to Oli Bazanich, his last five games, his long range oh. shooting was outstanding. Oh, what? Because of his goal at Easter Road? Yeah. Oh no, I find myself actually getting angry at that. I mean, how how could he have ever thought that he got the job? Or would get the job. That was it, the bit I didn't like, where he kind of jokingly weird. was like, he was just kind of like, "Hey, maybe, maybe we don't need to do any more interviews." I was like, after that Rangers performance, you say that. Oh, it, it, it actually really angered me. He was like listing off all these facts and claiming that he's got a, a good record as an interim manager and saying, "Oh, maybe I should stay in that role." Uh, no, we we don't want you here. Uh, I, I mean, Cammy. Budge obviously spoke about, you know, the amount of applications. I think there was something like over 70 applications with some really big names to people nobody had heard of. Um, Brian McLaughlin had mentioned Roy Keane and, and Davy Moyes being linked with the vacancy back then. D- do you seriously think that Hearts could appoint names of that calibre? Yeah, why not? I mean, given there was 70, there's obviously going to... Well, how true that is, I don't know, but if, if, if it's true and that it was 70 applicants, there's going to be some decent names in there, obviously. As, as you said, there's, there's some absolute nobodies that applied for that. Boys sticking their football manager CVs in for a laugh and stuff, but yeah, I reckon there probably were some decent named managers. Moyes maybe was, uh, obviously, his stock had kind of dropped at that stage, and I mean, Roy Keane, I found that one a bit bizarre. I mean, I think that just got all the hearts dads kind of like, yes, come on, we're going to have some big hard man in charge, and it's just going to be all shouty-shouty, and t- teams will be scared of us and that. I mean, I think there would have certainly been some interesting ones. Obviously, we've seen Stendhal obviously get chosen, and it'll probably not have been the only kind of different applicant. And one thing I was glad to see was the fact that Hearts did go down the Stendhal route rather than going for your, like the jobs for the boys, the, the kind of usual mm-hmm. law. Like, obviously, John Hughes wouldn't have came because of the Hibs connection, but like just kind of all those folk who always get linked with jobs, absolute diddies who've kind of had their time. So Neil I was McCann. quite glad to see. Aye, Neil McCann, obviously, a Hearts kind of. Well, would you say favourite? Yeah, um, but not managerial. <laughs> but ah, yeah, that Dundee spell was enough to put any club off. And if he's applied for that, he's he's having a right good laugh with himself. But as I say, the fact that they went down the Stendhal route was was quite impressive. I like the fact that they went down a a different and not so safe route, especially at a time where the club was was far from safe and really needed some kind of I don't know something a bit safer. But yeah, it was, it was certainly an interesting choice. Stephen Naismith t- talked about that. He said he was laughing off the rumours and kind of shrugging them off. And he said that somebody had made up a rumour of Neil McCann as manager and Naismith as his assistant, which I thought was absolutely bonkers. But I th- I- can I be honest? At-, at the time, I thought Davy Moyes was the outstanding choice. And like you touched on there, his stock had dropped and we were in a bit of a um, lull, let's say. Um, I-, I just thought that the two of them would go hand in hand and that Davy Moyes could obviously rescue us, maybe build up her reputation that little bit and we could obviously raise his stock again. Um but they didn't go into great depth on the documentary I thought. I I just wondered why there was a great deal of kinda of haggling to be had. Like was it just a case of encouraging Stendhal to come in? Because I think his enthusiasm was there to see after the unveiling. But I am really gutted that it didn't work out for him, to be honest. Oh, that's been... I mean, as we said earlier, we're recording this literally, currently, an hour before episode two. And I'm just going to have PTSD going through this episode because it's going to be the Stendhal episode. And I just... I've never, ever wanted it to work out for a manager like Daniel Stendhal. That 15 minutes or something at the end of him... Yeah, the end of that first episode with him being back in, I j- it it all came flooding back and how much I miss him and how much I loved him immediately and just he is the definition of right guy wrong time because if he had his players, I think we would have been quality. Well, it, even when the players came to discuss them, I mean, the the Porty Pirlo mentioned his intense taste. Stephen Naismith described it as, as a forward's dream. We obviously spoke about Levine, but I, I felt as though maybe Stephen Naismith's comments in particular felt as though there was 
not animosity as such, but I feel like there's stuff that we don't know about with Levine. Was that was that just me, or I, I felt as though that was really the case? Um, I, th- I I get where you're coming from. I think just I think Naismith's, for example, his comment in isolation, I think is just speaking about Stendhal because, as I mentioned earlier, Levine's tactic was don't lose, whereas Stendhal's tactic was defending is optional, and we're just going to throw everything including the kitchen sink forward. So I think Naismith was just kind of like, he was buzzing. But that does come from a place of going, I wasn't buzzing under the previous institution. No, that, that's true. Um, it's funny you mentioned the, the defensive stuff. I, I thought the manager hunt stuff was, was quite funny. When Lockie was obviously asked about who was going to be the next gaffer, and even... Even Katrina McCallum talking about the one fan asking about uh, Jose Mourinho, but obviously saying that he was available, but he might be a bit too defensive, I thought was, was quite funny. Um, but no, I, I don't know. I think after that, my mind my mind really was boggling. I've got to be honest, but I'm, I'm looking forward to the second episode, which, as you say, is tonight on the night recording, and then obviously the finale next week. Can I just say something about it and be really, really boring and stuff that no one will care about? No, go on. So I'm I'm a pathetic person who likes sound editing and cinematography and structure and stuff like that. I think the structure of it is weird. In terms of, I'm nicking this from Robert Borthwick, who I heard him speaking about it, and I, I thought this as I was watching it, and I was like, right, he said it so I can nick it. I don't understand why they didn't structure the documentary around Edinburgh Derbies. I know that might sound like obsessive and stuff like that, but that's not what I mean. I think you could have done this. You start this episode that we're, we've just spoken about on the back of the Hickey Derby, where we just beat Hibs at Easter Road 2-1. However, Levine's under a lot of pressure. Obviously, you saw the fans from that game in it, um, protesting and stuff like that. You then go through that episode, Levine gets sacked, stuff like that, Stendhal gets brought in, and you end this episode just as Stendhal is about to take charge of his first derby, the Boxing Day derby. Second episode starts, it's the Boxing Day derby where we get beat, and it just shows you how the club is at an all-time low, blah, blah, blah. That episode finishes just as Stendhal's won the derby, the 3-1 derby away at Easter Road. The final episode starts as lockdown hits and we get beat by St Mirren. And then the ending could be Nielsen beating Hibs at Hamden, and it ends on a positive note going forward. It's not a bad shout, to be fair, although I think... I don't know whether the BBC are prepared to be bombarded with Hibs fans, and, you know, there'd probably be some, like, accusations of some agenda against Hibs, and that's probably the only reason... That's already getting so. said, though, so it doesn't even matter. Right. <laughs> oh, Definitely. <laughs> Where did you see that? I've just seen because basically let's let's be fair and honest. This is kind of a heart propaganda piece in the sense of a lot more scrutiny and harshness could have been put on even just that first episode. More scrutiny could have been put on the Levine situation. We could have actually seen Levine getting sacked. We could have seen more people hounding budge for taking ages to get a manager we could have seen more of the fans being angry however it was kind of presented in a way of like oh, we're all chugging along and doing it and the fans are a wee bit annoyed but we'll get through it it's all right so as a result i've just seen loads of non-hearts fans saying it was quite boring because all the explosive things you expected to have happen didn't really happen cammy when did you tweet out about it being boring <laughs> What, what do you make of that? Do you go along with that? I, I wouldn't necessarily say it was born. Perhaps from you, from a heart's perspective, you can have more of an inside kind of. You, you were more in the know about the whole situation, but on the whole, I mean, for Scottish football, also we've seen, as, as was mentioned earlier on in the podcast, the kind of success of these other kind of style fly on the wall documentaries uh, down south and abroad and stuff like that. So, I mean, I think it's a first attempt from the BBC at kind of something like this. I'd like to see more, and obviously they'll learn with that. I mean, if you probably look back at the first All or Nothing that uh, Amazon done, compared to the most recent one, it'll be worlds apart in terms of quality. Mm. And obviously, 
BBC have got different kind of budgets and there's, there's just a lot of kind of variables in this, but I wouldn't necessarily say it was boring for me. I, I do agree that they, they kind of missed out some important bits, but then again, how much Hearts have obviously agreed to do this and perhaps that was on the basis that you're, you're getting so much, but if we, we're sacking him, you're not getting in the room, that I think there must have been some sort of trade-off um, mm. because Hearts, I mean, it would have kind of made a bit of a mockery of Hearts, I think, if everything was there and you would have just I mean, I think as well, the fact that Levine got sacked, given his Hearts connection and stuff, maybe it was, maybe Hearts saying, we're sacking him, but we, we want to kind of be decent folk. We don't want to do it kind of on the telly kind of thing. But to be honest, I really don't know. But on the whole, I, I mean, I quite enjoyed the, the first episode. Obviously, we need to see what the second and the third episodes are like. And yeah, it will be really interesting to see how the kind of series pans out. Absolutely. Now, of course, Cammy you'll be able to, to give us the rundown on Dunfermline's campaign so far. So Robbie Nielsen comes up against his former Hearts assistant manager the first time around in, in Stevie Crawford. You guys are unbeaten in the league, along with us. Topped your Betfred Cup in similar fashion to the mighty Jambos with four wins from four. So you must be absolutely delighted with the start so far. It's, it's the best in your history, is that right? I'm not entirely sure if that's the case, but it's certainly up there, but absolutely delighted with the way we've started as you say unbeaten very nearly came to an end at the weekend actually we had a bit of a scare against Clyde but the fact we managed to come from behind late on get two goals and get the win I mean I think this shows the kind of quality and character this team possesses even if with all due respect to them it was Clyde I mean I don't really think I can make any complaints with regards to how we've started the season both in the cup and in the league um if I was to be really, really picky, I think I'd maybe moan about the draw against Air, but I, I mean, I think that would just be going a bit far. We we didn't really deserve anything from that one. A really dull game. We cancelled each other out, and as kind of games at Somerset between the two sides are, they're typically really hard fought matches. Very little in them, and yeah, that that's probably the only real negative point of the season so far. If I had to be really picky, but massively positive start for us so far, and, and long may it continue as far as I'm concerned. I was going to say, because Somerset is one of those grounds, one of those tricky grounds to, to kind of go. Do you think that it's perhaps because you've not got a, a heart's dud on loan as to why you've performed so well <laughs> so far this season? Because even, even in recent memory, I think we've talked about it, we've had in recent seasons, Gavin Riley, Aidan Keener, Mallory Martin, Harry Cochran and Anthony McDonald off the top of my head alone, I think. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a mixed bag. Obviously, I quite liked Aidan Keener for the short time he was there. Yes. Scored a few, yes, scored a few cracking goals. Um, I mean, Gavin Riley, perhaps the worst player I've seen in a Paris shirt alongside Robbie Muirhead, also a former Hearts man. Um, <laughs> then, also, Mallory Martin, divided opinion. I thought he was cool. He, he just kind of strolled about, was slow, and I, mean, I can't remember who it is and what game it was, but there's a gif of him getting absolutely bodied and he goes flying. It is one of the funniest things, I think, from that kind of rather forgettable season for the Pars. And, I mean, Harry Cochran was was rotten. Uh, I was really disappointed by that. And then Anthony McDonald, I think he played once because he got injured, kind of went back to use for treatment, came back, got injured again. And then that, that was kind of that for, for him. So, yeah, mi mixed bag with regards to them, but... I mean, the, the team are really doing well. I, I feel we've recruited really well. We obviously lost the star man last season, trying not to well up here. Um, Kevin Nisbet departed. Uh, and, I mean, it was it, it was inevitable that was going to happen after the season he had. Um, players don't players like that don't stay around in the championship for too long. And although this is going to annoy Hughes, I am absolutely delighted to see him absolutely flying at the Hibs at the, oh. at the, Hibs, at oh. Hibs at the moment. <laughs> well... It's funny you mentioned the, the recruitment because I think outsiders looking in, my, myself included, have been impressed. Um, I, I know that you're obviously a, a realist. What, what were you kind of hoping for at the start of the season? Were playoffs a minimum for you or could you have foreseen a, a, poten a potential title challenge even? I think the playoffs was the absolute minimum um, that we had to achieve. Obviously, last season we missed out on them and we've kind of always... Since I kind of returned to the championship a few seasons ago, we've always kind of been there or thereabouts, with the exception of one season. And I mean, I think that was that was always the main goal. I think if we could have given a well, if we can give a good chance for the title, fantastic. But that that's certainly not the main goal that 
that we've got. I mean, we've, we've started the season really well, but even still, it's it's far too early to say if we can truly challenge ourselves for the title. Um, we made a really good start, and I mean, if you ask me again in a few weeks, uh, can the form continues, that might change, but I think it's hard to see past yourselves for the title. Um, as much as that pains me to say, obviously, I want to see the Powers do well, but the Hearts team is far above the, the best kind of equipped team in the league, biggest budget, and some some players could quite easily play in the Premiership, and I know a lot's kind of been said, a lot of people have said it's a Premiership squad, and a lot of that team is the team that got relegated last season, but even still, you look at Naismith, you look at Halkett, you look at Craig Gordon, Boyce, and th that's only naming a few of them. They, they're players who could easily play at the level above, granted, last time it, out, it never really worked for them, but yeah, I mean, a, a fantastic squad, and it'll be a really interesting challenge, obviously. There's another team kind of made a fantastic start in Fife Rivals, Rafe Rovers. Um, a bit of a surprise start from them. I don't think I was really expecting to see much from them, but they've come up and really shown that their championship quality and maybe a bit early, but perhaps a bit of a dark horse because nobody really expected them to do well at all and they've started the season fantastically well. Oh, of course, and I, I know that there's a lot of jambos that aren't keen on uh, Wraith Rovers given the summer, so we'll, we'll, we'll skip on from them, but I know that obviously you've mentioned Kevin Nisbet there. How, just how big a blow was it for the Pars to lose him? I know that there's a lot of jambos that would have loved to see us sign him, were you particularly bothered by where he'd end up? Was it just a case of as much money as is possible? I wasn't too bothered. The only place I was kind of saying no, no chance was Dundee United when Robbie was still there. And that was kind of due to his comments in the kind of January transfer window. I think they kind of made bids and obviously we knocked them back. And then as the kind of end of the season, well, when the season was curtailed and the kind of transfer window was close to opening, he was, he was just seeing a lot of comments and I, he just came across like a total dick. Uh, to put it kind of nicely and yeah Dundee United have taken a few players off us in recent seasons who've done well and to have seen him go right along to to Tannadice would have would have been a sore one um, obviously I said to you tons kind of when the whole rumour was about his future I said you should have been absolutely all over him of course your Edinburgh rivals beat him uh, beat you to him and I, I mean I think it was given the circumstances the best deal we could have got I think it was 250k in add-ons and this has ultimately allowed us to build the squad that we got. We were able to get kind of fast out the blocks and make some of the signings that other teams might have been able to make had had they made such a kind of big a big sale. Obviously, a massive departure. He, he had about 20 goals last season. And as, as I said earlier on, you, you, you can't really replace players like that. But the fact we've managed to bring in Declan McManus and Kevin O'Hara, I, mean, I think that's really good. We've managed to bring in two strikers to replace one rather than trying to find a like-for-like a -like replacement. McManus and O'Hara definitely not as prolific as, as Nisbet, but two players who I think can certainly make up or maybe even surpass the kind of goal tally that Nisbet made last season uh, on his own. Um, this season, McManus has three goals and four assists in eight games, and O'Hara's got five goals in eight games. So they've certainly started started life well. Obviously, McManus in his second spell for the club now, and O'Hara uh, also just joining from Aloe in the summer. And, yeah, quite quite sharp with that. Obviously, they're not Kevin Nisbet. There's very few players who could be Kevin Nisbet. Um, but as I said earlier on, delighted to see Nisbet doing so well. Um, and for the rest of the recruitment, I mean, we managed to bring Dom Thomas back. Adam, you know, kind of from all the messages at the end of last, kind of the end of last season when he came on loan from Kilmarnock. I mean, what a player this boy is. And yeah, he's started the season on fire. Him and you and Murray, perhaps the best partnership since Jack and Victor. Um, just absolutely superb, always combining, and yeah, really tough with it. Another notable signing would be Stephen Whitaker, um, obviously Scotland, former Scotland international, really experienced head who's kind of coming in and replaced Paul Payton in that experienced role. When like a team with a lot of young heads, and then we also brought in Paul Watson um, from Dundee United, who obviously won the the championship last year. And then we've also got a Welsh international on that team, and Owen Fawn Williams and goals, who's been solid thus far. You obviously mentioned the squad there, and you touched on Ewan Murray, who's just coincidentally won Championship Player of the Month. Stevie Crawford has obviously won Manager of the Month. That must just be a massive boost for the Pars going forward with some big cla big clashes to come, even. Yeah, it's a huge boost, and it's, it's always good to see your players and managers get recognised for their efforts. So of course, I've already touched on Murray. Captain Fantastic, he has... Been, in fact, I think he might actually be a top scorer this season, uh, perhaps combined with McManus. He just, every corner we seem to get, seems to be on his head, seems to be in the back of the net, and 
mean, long may that continue. As far as I'm concerned, it's been it's been absolutely fantastic seeing him and Dom Thomas kind of link up how they have. Um, Murray spent a lot of last season out injured. He took a really sore one against Queen of the South early on, which kept him out for a long time. And by the time Dom Tom was in, and yeah, there wasn't really that time to kind of gel together, but they've certainly kicked it off really well this season. Uh, as I say, almost every set piece seems to be Dom Thomas right onto the head of Ewan Murray into the back of the net. And I mean, teams haven't really been able to stop this. Queen of the South tried in a recent match. They let Murray score a header uh, early on. They then kind of realised, right, we can't leave him. So then they left Paul Watson open. Paul Watson then scored later on. So certainly set pieces are something that we've had great success from this season. And that's largely due to Dom Thomas actually being able to deliver a corner. Um, for years at the Pars, we have had corners hitting off first men, corners going over absolutely everyone. And yeah, to have someone that can actually hit a, a set piece is fantastic and we're reaping the rewards of that. Don't even get me started on corners. Honestly, the biggest bugbear of mine going to the football, I think... <sighs> It's, they're certainly up there anyway, but you've mentioned, obviously, the, the duo up front in McManus and O'Hara, and I've seen Dom Thomas gain rave reviews from, from some supporters on social media. What do you kind of see as the key battles on, on Friday evening? I think one of the key battles for me will be kind of what I've just spoken about, Ewan Murray versus Hearts at Corners. I think it's going to be a tight one between two sides performing very well, um, and if Pars can get set pieces, they'll look to take full advantage of them. Um I think if you can mark Ewan Murray really well, that, that certainly is a real blow to the pars. Of course, we've got Declan McManus and Kevin O'Hara can, who can score, and we've got Dom Thomas who can obviously create. Um, but yeah, Ewan Murray versus yourself at corners is going to be a key battle, at least from a pars perspective. Then another one for me is Dom Thomas versus whoever you will line up at right back, which I'm presuming will be Mikey Smith. Now, yeah, Mikey thanks. Smith uh, is a player who, since coming into the championship, has, has really impressed me a solid 7 out of 10 each week you know what you're getting from him and whilst maybe not as attacking as your Stephen Kingsley and certainly not providing as many goals of course he got that goal against Dundee the first goal in the championship he's he's really solid and we kind of seen his playmaking ability as well with his long ball against Arbroath that was a game that I felt he's really struggled in and really underwhelmed in um, especially after that Dundee game really nice ball to him and White and as you touched on earlier he, he's he's doing really well at the moment. Obviously, had a good kind of wee loan spell at Arbroath last season. And you know what? I'm, I'm quite glad to see him. Um, obviously, a, a really kind of promising youngster when he was at Dundee. And for a multitude of reasons, things never worked out um, uh, worked out for him initially at Hearts. But things are now working for him. And I think that's a, a huge boost to, to Hearts, um, especially considering Liam Boyce hasn't really impressed me all that much this season. Yes, he's got, I think, maybe, what, one or two goals. But... I mean, I was kind of expecting him to be running away with the golden boot by this stage. And then, obviously, Naismith has, I believe, only one championship appearance to his name. So he's not played too much. And perhaps as the season goes on, that, that connection between th those three will get better and there will be more goals. But certainly Whiten, at the moment, is a player who's caught my eye and maybe a kind of under-the-radar star for Hearts uh, if he's on against the Pars, one that we definitely need to keep an eye on. But going back to the battle between Dom Thomas and Mikey Smith, um, Thomas has five assists in eight games already this season as the main creator and, yeah, an absolutely fantastic player. There's a reason he is the song, uh, well, the Starman song's about him. Um, so, yeah, that, that's certainly interesting ones that I think, from a Pars perspective anyway, what, what kind of key battles do you think Kind of from a heart's perspective, um, it is a <sighs> Daniel. Thoughts? Well, well, this is the thing now. I'm shitting myself because I don't think Michael Smith will play. Uh, I don't really? think Boyce Smith or Gordon will play because they get back Thursday afternoon and then are expected to play Friday night. Um, obviously, Boyce and Smith started yesterday against from Northern Ireland. Uh, from Northern Ireland sorry. Uh, I didn't actually pay attention to how many minutes they played, but I know they definitely started, so you assume they get at least a half. Um, obviously, teams play again on Wednesday night. I imagine Smith and Boyce will play again in that, as Nod Island now, unfortunately, don't have much to play for. Um, so that kind of worries me, because that means Jamie Brandon is up against Dom Thomas, which means Dom Thomas is going to get five assists. <laughs> um, <laughs> It, that that is a worry. Um, however, on the flip side, I actually think Craig Halkett could have a really really good game against Murray because I felt that 
How can Popescu this season? I said last week, Popescu is a complete bomb scare. It scares the shit out of me, and I love him for it because I just want to see what he does. Like, he's one of those players that I'm just like, oh, I know that you're probably going to, like, lose us a goal, but you could also score, like, a 40-yarder, so keep you in the team. Whereas Halkett, this this season especially, has kind of been the player that, as Cami hinted at, we wanted him to be last season. Um, I feel he's come in, been really composed. He's had the captain's armband on more than one occasion, and he's just kept everything really simple, and... What's been big for me is his man marking seems to have really improved. His positioning, he seems to now actually have an understanding on how to play against strikers, especially strikers that play off the shoulder. Um, and I think if Halkett, if Nielsen does go, right, Craig, you're on Murray, I think it could be a really good day for us, but it means that Halkett will have to be at 100% concentration at all times. But my main point is, I think Stephen Kingsley could have a great game because the games that Stephen Kingsley hasn't been too great in which is I'm being nice there because he's played great in every game but for example the Abroath game and the Inverness games were against two sides who didn't really push us they sat in a lot and that doesn't really benefit Stephen Kingsley because he's quite as Cammy said an attacking fullback however his two best games have come against Hibs and Dundee two teams that really pushed us and were looking for spaces. I think Dunfermline will push us and look for spaces because I think they'll go, listen, we've got a chance here. We're playing as well as them. There is no reason that we can't win, especially because, as I said, I don't think Craig Gordon will play. I think it will be Stuart and goals. And while Stuart has impressed me so far, he's, I don't think he's made a single mistake. Uh, he made a couple of good saves against East Fife as well. I don't th- I'm don't. i not as confident in him as I am with Craig Gordon. So... I think if Dunfermline do push and do attack, it will allow Stephen Kings to bomb forward and not necessarily score, but just create issues and get, for example, he got his assist against Inverness by doing exactly that, where he just picked up the ball, drove forward and played the ball in the box and we immediately scored from it. But what about you, Adam? What do you think? Well, it's funny you mention that because our last trip to East End, I can remember Bobby Lamal having an absolute blinder as the Pars found themselves on the, the wrong end of a 1-0 defeat. Rather unluckily, I thought. I thought they actually gave us a really good game. Um, I've just checked the Northern Ireland team, coincidentally. Liam Boyce got just over an hour uh, right. before he was hauled off, and the best footballer at the club got uh, the full 90 minutes. So, yeah. So, uh, I, I mean, I... I think Gordon's probably the most likely to make out the three. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't. I wouldn't be against starting uh, Craig White, to be honest, up front, because mm-hmm. I feel like you could run maybe you and Murray in behind. It. I don't know. Um, but Michael Smith could potentially be a, a big blow. So thanks, Ian Barraclough, for uh, ruining our chances on Friday night. Really appreciate that. <laughs> um, in a meaningless kind of two-one defeat as well to Austria. So that's fantastic. Love it. Um, but no, it's. Um, I, th- I think it should be a, a really good fixture on Friday night. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I, I feel as though Dunfermline can hurt us, and I feel as though we can't be too complacent. They are where they are in the league for a reason, and they should be given the maximum respect. Score predictions. I'll, I'll let the guest go first, young Cameron. See, this is what I hate, because I'll get clipped on this <laughs> by Hearts fans going... Ah, but Big Specky says 4 0 to the Pars. <laughs> Way. Eh, I, I really don't know, obviously, off the back of what you've said regarding potential players missing. I mean, that gives me a bit more confidence. I mean, I'm completely confident in the team that we can give you a right good game. Um, we've seen in that Arbroath game how, when you don't kind of be as, as direct, how much you struggle. Ar- Arbroath really frustrated you. It was a kind of typical Arbroath performance. And I think if we can take elements from that performance in terms of our defensive play and then can I use our attacking play that we've seen in multiple matches this season that we've scored multiple goals in I mean I think we could be in for a real cracker um, I'm going to go for a 1-1 draw, play it safe but if, if the Pars sneak a win I'll certainly not co- I'll certainly not complain I thought you'd back the boys mate I'm slightly disappointed but no I, I, I get where you're coming from I, I think uh, yeah I, I, don't, I don't see why not but, oh, do, do I make a prediction and look like an absolute numpty? Can I just say, the last prediction actually came to fruition, which was the Hibs game. 
True. Very do true. I, do I opt for another? I, I've I've got I've got two one hearts in my head. Bold. Oh, uh, which is bold. That would be a great result for us. It would be. Yeah, I'll go with it. I'll go with Dunfermline Athletic one, Heart of Midlothian two. Just I think you'll, I think you'll be tight this. Daniel. Well, um, sticking with Cami's thought process. However, I think it'll be two all, not one all, because I think two. both sides have clear goal scoring ability. But I just see this being one of those games where both defences have an absolute nightmare. I know I've just spent five minutes speaking about how good Craig Halkett's been, but Popescu's in that defence, and I love how mental he is, and he's going to con- make us concede, and I just think Craig White is the best player on the planet, so he's going to score twice. <laughs> Magic. Well, I, c- I, couldn't put up, I couldn't sum it up any better than that. Um, thanks very much for coming on, Cammy. All the best for your, your championship campaign. Friday night and obviously further hearts fixtures aside but where can the Jambos find you online because you're everywhere Hey Jambos you can send me abuse at Cami Anders on Twitter uh, if that's what you want to do um, you can also find me on the Pure Championship podcast I do a weekly podcast alongside my co-host Chris Sampson we dissect all things championship we've had some really good podcasts lately we've had some players and managers on and we've got some cracking interviews lined up for the coming week so yeah, if you're wanting to learn more about the best league in the world, um, yeah, check that out on all the kind of usual podcasty places. Absolutely top draw that podcast, by the way. Daniel, we'll obviously be back next week, but thank you for joining me as always. Where can the Jambos find you? No worries, mate. It's been a pleasure. And I am at Mackay the Mark if you want to see my new mane that I have. Fantastic. I am at Adam T. Kendall. We are at Perth Basil on all the socials. Or alternatively, you can email us, perthbasil at gmail.com. A pupper predicts will be out for the Pars game, thumbnail courtesy of Cami, so stay tuned for that. Enjoy the Dunfermline match, and we'll see you all next time.